Welcome to Climate Optimus. I'm Jason Lewis. And I'm Todd Deshida. Thanks for tuning in. As a reminder, uh, the podcast will be on spring break the next two weeks. We will be releasing some short clips each week to keep you tied it over and then resume full length episodes in April. In last week's Reason for Hope, we highlighted the International Energy Agency's report, it's always a mouthful, that uh, talked about how the EU could cut its reliance on Russian gas imports by 30% within the next year. This week, we'll be taking a deeper look at the Ukraine conflict and what it could mean more broadly for climate change. Heavy stuff. (laughs) (laughs) It is, and we're going to do our best to to parse it while understanding that the reality is there is going to be some, you know, near-term focus that's taken away from climate related efforts because we have this acute crisis. Right. Um, but nonetheless that shouldn't prevent us from seeing the big picture in all of it which should hopefully um, help us move forward, you know, and accelerate our our response to climate change. So before we we dig in to Ukraine and climate change, let's talk about this week's reason for hope. So Stellantis, the maker of uh, Jeep and Dodge, is finally stepping up on electric vehicles. And they've just released what they're calling their Dare Forward 2030 strategy, which says by 2030, 50% of their U.S. sales will be electric vehicles and 100% of their European sales will be electric vehicles, not carbon neutral till 2038, ironically, but I think that's super exciting looking at those EU sales numbers. Yeah, 2038, okay. Well, very good. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure, it it seems like they're, it should have been maybe Dare Ford 2038, but (laughs) feels like maybe their marketing folks uh, didn't expect people to read the fine print. Well, Dare Forward 2038 probably doesn't roll off the tongue. Is that what it is, maybe? As well as 2030? Well, it just doesn't look as good either. Let's let's be clear. No, no. I mean, I guess the easier thing would have been to just suck it up and commit to being carbon neutral by 2030. But, That's true. You know, we all make choices. Yeah, yeah. So some might be wondering kind of like, you know, why are they latecomers to the game? And it feels like maybe their their CEO is at least in part the reason I don't know if you have thoughts there. CEO Carlos Tavares is his name. Well, I don't think he's a huge fan of this whole thing. (laughs) Uh, You know, he believes that EVs are 50% more expensive to produce and that this whole electrification of the auto industry basically is being imposed on the auto industry, right? So he's kind of, it seems like he's kind of going along with this, like kicking and, you know, (laughs) kicking and screaming a little bit. <laughs> right. But, you know, obviously he's seen the the writing on the wall here and and he knows uh, which side his his bread gets buttered on and he's going to he's going to comply. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, really this just feels like he's jealous of Tesla's share price. That's probably exactly it. <laughs> well, I, I agree with you though. It, it is it is a hopeful sign in my mind. Not just that they've announced this, which is great. But I think in large part because this guy is, you know, clearly not that worried about climate change and and feels like he's doing this whole thing reluctantly. It's like right. if somebody who really doesn't want to be doing this still feels compelled to do it, that that's the best of all, right? Yeah, it means that the dollars and cents are there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe uh maybe Toyota will uh will finally follow along. It's so weird. Yeah, it really is. You would just think that was a given. Yeah, stranger things. So let's talk about the Ukraine conflict and, you know, oil and kind of its nexus to climate change. And we felt like, you know, it might be helpful first to just talk a little bit about, you know, Russia as a, you know, a fossil fuel player in the global market. They are, you know, top three um, largest oil producers, you know, along with the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. There's a 2019 snapshot that we were looking at where, you know, they're the second largest oil and second largest natural gas producer Mm. 60% of their exports are you know fossil fuels and uh, you know all that leads to 40% of their federal budget you know being being fossil fuel based when it comes to you know looking at dependency you know Europe gets roughly 40% 
of its natural gas supply from Russia. And if we look at the U.S., the U.S. gets about 8% of its its oil supply from Russia. So pretty big delta there. And, mm-hmm. you know, obviously why Europe has, has been a lot more concerned about what the conflict might mean in terms of, you know, the supply of natural gas. But the reality is the fact that Russia is such a big fossil fuel producer is a huge, you know, source of power for them. Uh, you know, it's enabled them to kind of reestablish their power in the in the global stage, you know, enabled them to increase spending on defense and security. It enables them to project, you know, economic and political power over those who are, you know, dependent on their oil. And then, you know, as we just mentioned, it, you know, it's a huge source of government funding and and really enables them to maintain, you know, regime stability. Right. The one irony to me of, you know, Russia as a fossil fuel producer is you would think when you're that dependent on fossil fuels that you'd be looking at climate change and thinking, wow, we should really start planning ahead. Yeah. And the reality is they haven't. And it doesn't seem like they are. You know, sure, there have been some actions that acknowledge that, you know, climate change is a problem and that they're, you know, having businesses track their emissions. But yeah, if you want to get into this, there's a great analysis called Energy, Climate Change, and Security, the Russian Strategic Conundrum. And it's pretty wonky, but it but it talks about all this and how mm-hmm. how despite the writing on the wall with, you know, climate change, you know, Russian leadership really hasn't thought about strategically how they're gonna deal with the fact that fossil fuel demand is ultimately gonna gonna fall. Right. They're probably you know, under the same delusion, right, that some of these big oil companies are, right? And they're just probably want to see if they can ride this golden goose as long as they can. I mean, that would be my guess. I think you would you're think probably they right. would be more strategic about it since they are a country and not a company, but And you hope for the sake of the Russian people that, you know, that there's a, a pivot there. But but yeah, it the longer they can obviously delay climate action on the part of other countries, the longer they have that market available. So mm-hmm. Really, no different than you know, kind of the the, the self interest of like an Exxon Mobil or a or a BP or Shell. Yeah, well, this is probably a wake up call for sure. Then, because the, the way that some of this is going, and we'll get more into that. But yeah, indeed. Well, I think that really leads into the you know the next big point, which is the Ukraine conflict is really a harsh reminder of you know how volatile fossil fuels can be and how they can be you know weaponized. I mean, if you look back and i think in america we have a pretty you know short memory when it comes to um spikes in oil but there's a long history going back obviously you know the biggest one to the the 1973 opec oil embargo but mm-hmm. it's not like that's the only one i mean there's spikes throughout leading up you know through the financial crisis of 08 and then obviously to the you know current state with the situation with russia but you look at the graph of you know U.S. oil prices, and <laughs> it looks like a hell of a you know roller coaster ride, just up and down over the past fifty years. Yeah, definitely. So the reality is, the oil market is volatile, and you know the other piece of this is that as you look at these past spikes, it it isn't just a supply and demand game, right? It's mm-hmm. major, you know, it's wars, uh, natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina, you know, global financial crisis, and then you also have this most recent spike, we haven't even seen the effects of this embargo yet on on Russian oil. And so all this price increase is just a result of speculation on, right. you know, on the part of these traders who are looking at oil futures. Yeah. I, I think too, people want to simplify this to trade between two countries, right? Well, what do we get from from Russia, you know, in the US or whatever it is, or what does this country get between these two? We'll just cut them off. And, you know, the reality is, is it's a pretty complex world market. What a couple countries do or what one country does can affect the whole thing for everybody, right? And so the fact of the matter is when everybody's just dependent on this stuff, these things hurt everybody. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a, you know, a sort of underscores the second point, which is, you know, when we look beyond the the volatility, you start talking about the price and this who supplies who, it really is, you know, illustrates how oil can be weaponized. And, you know, obviously the focus right now is on Russia and being able to to move away from Russian oil. But, you know, there's a lot of other bad actors out there like Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and Iran. And 
when you can't get the oil from one of them, you got to make up that shortfall somewhere, right? And yeah, you're just robbing Peter to pay Paul. I mean, that and that's what we did. That's one of the things that's been done to try to combat this is we've approached Saudi Arabia. And of course they said, you know, go pound sand because they're, you know, they're in support of Russia on this deal. And then Venezuela, you know, which has, you know, terrible things going on and people fleeing the country and people starving to death. And I'm sure they would love the money, but, but basically you're just, you know, you're just going to another set of bad actors and just kicking the can down the road on this problem. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, if you're just moving between drug dealers, right? None of them are, None of them, none of these are, are good people. Um, and so yeah. it's just whoever's the lesser of the evils at the time that you need your, your supply. So knowing that oil is this volatile commodity that can, you know, wreak havoc economically and knowing how, you know, it can be weaponized in the case of, you know, Russia and Ukraine, it sort of leads into the question of like, well, what is all this going to mean for climate change? Right. And mm-hmm. I think in a simplistic sense, you could see at least two potential paths. One being it it takes our focus away because obviously having Russia invade Ukraine merits everybody rallying and and doing right. what we can to to help them. But you know if, if this becomes protracted, you could see how you know it really takes the wind out of the sails of the work that was done like at COP twenty six and and really doesn't set us up well for the next climate summit that'll be in in Egypt this year. I think the other path is that this could actually help accelerate climate action and help us avoid a tipping point. And so maybe we should start first with uh, with what's been happening in the EU. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think to, to answer the question of what is this going to mean for climate change, I think it, it's looking that it's going to be you know, long-term good uh, for climate change because I think people are realizing this fact in the EU, especially is like, we need to get off of reliance on this stuff, you know, especially our reliance on fossil fuels coming from Russia. Unfortunately, it might, it's not going to probably be fast enough maybe to help Ukraine in the short term, you know, that, that ship had kind of already sailed because of the dependence and right. And so that lever in some ways kind of worked for, for Putin on that, but I don't think as well as he thought it was going to, right. I think, I think he thought he had a bigger hammer than he did. I think he underestimated that. I think he underestimated the world response to to this. And I think he underestimated Ukraine's ability to fight on the ground. And we'll, we'll see what if those two things can come together to, to save Ukraine somehow. But the EU response has been really beyond what I thought it was going to be. Germany you know, already committed 200 billion euros to bring forward its goal of 100% renewable by more than a decade, you know, that's pretty, pretty staggering because they get 40% right of their natural gas from Russia, which is a huge number, which leads me back to my rant during our, our nuclear uh, episode about Germany and kind of the closing down of, of these 17 nuclear reactors that they started like a decade ago. Right. And then those things produced a quarter of their electricity at the time. And, you know, unfortunately, most of that was replaced by by coal and gas. And so, which I know we talked about, and I still think it's bananas to do that, right? To, from a, yeah. both a climate standpoint, and if you look at what's going on right now, I mean, this is a, if they had that capacity still, it would be huge in the decisions they could make right now. Those nuclear reactors running with, with what amounts to clean energy, right? And, you know, I know the Fukushima thing really kind of was a catalyst for a lot of this politically in Germany. I know Thomas Mills, is, he's going to listen to this down there in, in Tasmania, and he's going to be rolling his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but Thomas, you need to listen to me. But, you know, Fukushima was bad. Don't get me wrong. 150,000 people displaced from the radiation, and, and, and that's all terrible. Don't get me wrong. And I'm not saying we should build a bunch of new plants or anything. Yeah, but, I was going to say, you're not, you're not advocating for putting in new nuclear. No, but they had already been running. So, yeah, not, not to knock Germany too hard, because obviously their goals on climate were already, you know, ambitious, right? And now they're even going to be more so. So they're headed in the right direction. And just so we don't have listeners trying to get your home address for calling nuclear power clean, I think we clarify that what you meant <laughs> <laughs> was that it's probably neutral. Yeah. Well, and, and if we look beyond Germany, there's been some other positive developments. Uh, the UK 
I think after the U.S. announced that we're going to ban Russian oil imports, has said they're going to phase out Russian oil by year's end. Just to be clear, I know the U.K. is no longer part of the EU, but <laughs> I just forget sometimes that, you know, especially because it's still part of Europe and NATO, for a simple American mind, it's hard to keep track of these things. And the EU just released an outline of a plan they're calling Repower EU. And while this is just a, you know, a draft, if you will, the plan calls for cutting Russian gas two thirds by year end, which is just crazy. I would have never guessed that they would have been able to even conceive that, but that that's really awesome. I mean, that's a that's actually real timeline stuff almost here, you know? I mean, that that becomes a significant tool, you know, for Ukraine can hold out for a little bit longer and something like that comes down, you know? I mean, that could be, we, we could talk about shifting the, the dynamic there almost. Yeah, and I think tying it back to climate, I think the, the exciting elements of the outline are focused on accelerating their transition to renewable energy. Part of the plan is focused on, you know, obviously buying natural gas elsewhere, increasing their, you know, stored supply of natural gas so they're better prepared as they head into the next winter. But, you know, they've got measures to streamline the permitting process for new renewable energy projects. They want to double their renewable natural gas production by 2030, boost renewable hydrogen, increase energy efficiency. So, I mean, they're effectively taking what was already their their blueprint and and just accelerating a lot of these measures. So that to me is, you know, a really exciting development in all of this is to see that in the face of this conflict with Russia and the recognition of the damage that fossil fuels cause, you know, above and beyond the environment, that they're going to use this as a reason to just double down on their, you know, commitments of decarbonizing. Right. No, that is that's awesome. So if we move to the US response, there are really sort of two primary narratives underway. The first is sort of, you know, what's coming out of the White House and climate-focused lawmakers. And then the second is really kind of what you're hearing from the oil industry and, and pro-oil lawmakers. I don't know, you want to take a crack at the, uh, the first narrative? Yeah, I, I feel like the first narrative and Biden, the Biden administration has basically echoed this is to use this as a prime example of why we need to transition to clean and renewable energy, right? And and that's been, if you think about it, I mean, that's been the message of the renewable energy camp for for years, right? Since as long as I can remember. You know, obviously it's been about the climate, but the other facet of that is, hey, you don't have to depend on dealing with these crooks basically (laughs) anymore. And you're not beholden to to dealing with stuff like we're dealing with in Russia or Ukraine right now. You know, obviously one of the big steps, the Biden administration banned, you know, imports of Russian oil, which is, yeah, I think a significant step. Obviously, we're not a huge importer, as you said earlier. It's about eight eight percent, you know, of what we of what we import. So it's not gonna be it's not as big of a deal for us to do that as it is for a lot of those European Union countries, right? We're just not right. importing as much as them. So it's it's a a little bit more of a, what would you call it? I think it's, I mean, it's more than symbolic, but it, yeah. it, it doesn't have, it doesn't require the level of sacrifice that obviously Europe is going to have to face as they try to get off of, you know, they're a lot more entangled in Russian fossil fuels than, than we are. Right. And, and, you know, at the same time that uh, Biden's been talking about transitioning to, to renewables, there has been work to kind of re- reduce, you know, the near term price shocks that we've kind of been experiencing here with, you know, releasing production from the reserves and, uh, you know, calling on the, our domestic producers to kind of boost production. So there's been some efforts, I think, to try to stabilize, you know, oil prices. Um, but I think the most significant message that's coming out of this is the call to speed up our transition to clean energy. Senator Ed Markey has said, and I like this quote, the, this moment is a clarion call for the urgent need to transition to domestic clean energy so that we are never again complicit in fossil fuel funded conflict, which is totally legit because it's not, it's not just about Russia, right? I mean, this, is, this has been going on for years, this very thing. Uh, I also think there's a little grasping at straws here for people to use this thing, probably on both sides, uh, you know, to kind of push 
their agenda. It just happens to be that I agree with one of those agendas more than the other. And that's that we should just get <laughs> off of this stuff. Right. Um, right. So, yeah, I think, and I think a lot of it's obviously just a veil to, for people to express their annoyance of high prices at the pump, probably more than anything. So, yeah, but that kind of goes yeah. into the, the second narrative of this thing. Yeah. So the first narrative, you know, accelerating our transition away from clean energy, the second narrative being, you know, this is really underscoring the need to ramp up fossil fuel production and yeah. Biden is a reason for high gas prices. You've got, you know, oil execs in Houston, you know, calling for expansion of fossil fuel production. There's this quote that I just couldn't help myself. The chairman of uh, mm. Tellurium Inc., a liquid natural gas developer, said, since the consequences of climate change are going to be 30 to 40 years down the road, people are going to focus more on what's happening now, as they should. We can come back to climate. If there's a quote that, that underscores the propaganda. It's stupidity. <laughs> of the oil industry that that is it you know you've got you've got potential to boost fracking but there's been a reluctance since well before the ukraine conflict because of the past boom and bust cycles the industry has gone through to go out and drill any new wells and then you've got the american petroleum institute that was already using the high energy prices as a way to extract concessions from the white house they apparently sent them a wish list, it, you know, got things on there like speeding up the regulatory processes around offshore leasing. The irony is with their wish list is that they're not including any information about how it would help, you know, <laughs> how quickly it would help. And then, you know, when you move to kind of these, I call them oil state senators, you know, they're just singing the same tune, which is, hey, this is a call to boost oil production in my state so that, right. you know, we can, we can benefit from it. I mean, I think that's an interesting point though, that it really is the, the producers that are unwilling to boost production. Right. Because I think if you look at a lot of people in the country, they think, you know, Biden just has some lever in his office that he can just go over to the control <laughs> panel and turn, <laughs> turn production up or something. Right. And the fact of the matter is he really doesn't. I mean, he can ask him, he can try to try to get him to do it. And and that's the point of this whole thing, right? When you're talking about that the solution is just boost more production and all you're doing there is just following the same kind of thought process we've always followed that got us here in the first place, because it's just a couple other crooks at the end of this line as it is the other one. <laughs> right. I mean, when those people are at the pump and they're angry, you know, they should just know first and foremost that those oil producers could drop these prices down, right? that they're paying and they don't want to for their own gain. And yeah. if you're tired of that, the way to do it is to just say, let's get away from this as a, as an energy source, right? Completely. I mean, the reality is they're not going to tell us, but this situation with Russia is going to be a boon for the Exxon Mobiles of the world and their balance sheets. I mean, they're going to be making money hand over fist with the higher oil prices. Yeah. And to your point, they're, they're not offering to, you know, help help lessen the burden on American consumers. They could care less. It's yeah. a lot easier just to point at the guy in the White House and say, that's your problem. All of this leads to, well, what, you know, what lies ahead? I, I don't know that I can read the tea leaves, but I think th there is a real choice to make here. And it's clear in, you know, the EU momentum is in a hopeful direction, right? A, a recognition that hey, this is just one more reminder of why we need to, you know, we need to break up with fossil fuels, right? We need to end mm -hmm. this relationship. And I think the key here in the US is going to be what is the public dialogue about this, right? What are legislators hearing from their constituents? Because the reality is, you know, Biden gets it. You have a number of, you know, members of Congress who get it and understand that, you know, now ought to just be a catalyst for accelerating our transition away from fossil fuels. Yeah. But I, I think it's going to come down to how much the, you know, the American public is willing to stand up and say that, that that resonates with them as well. And that they're willing to, you know, make some near-term sacrifices with the recognition that long-term we get rid of this problem completely. Right. Right. And yeah, no, I think maybe the, to me, the second reason for hope of this topic is that, Russia's, you know, hold on on oil and gas was not as critical as 
he thought it was going to be. I mean, we talk about weaponizing it, and it is, but it wasn't as big of a weapon as he wanted. There's an interesting story I heard on on NPR, and we can link it here. And someone kind of compared the Civil War to this same this same event, and they basically thought incorrectly that cotton would be that they would not be messed with because of their production of cotton, right? Well, they were wrong. (laughs) And I think Putin was wrong here too, in much the same way. And it seems that rather than everybody panicking and folding, that the EU in particular has kind of made a statement that they're just going to double down on getting away from this and do it even faster than they were going to. And so it's pretty exciting. And it sounds like they're kind of going to lead the way. And I think, like you said, it's going to be, are we going to look at that as an example and and follow, right? And hopefully we do. Yeah, it's not going to be easy. But, you know, if the EU can follow through on this ambitious plan that they put forth and the UK and the US follow, it'd be massive. I mean, we're talking about 25% of the world's carbon emissions. And, you know, the best part is that we've, we've got momentum in this direction. You've got government talking about it. They just... They just need a a nudge from us. Definitely. And that leads to our weekly action opportunity. I want to encourage everybody to take a couple minutes, send a short message to your senator from their website, telling them that you agree with the president, that the conflict in Ukraine just underscores the need to accelerate our transition to clean energy, and that they need to pass the climate provisions of Build Back Better. As always, we'll have talking points in, in the show notes to make it easier Feel free to steal shamelessly. And, you know, don't forget that it takes fewer voices than you'd think to to get your legislators' attention. The reality is their offices track all the communication they receive on a given issue, whether via email, phone calls, or, you know, even on social media. Oh, yeah, the power of public opinion is huge. If you don't think so, just look at how much money governments spend to try to figure out what you think about (laughs) anything that they do. Yeah, that's a great point. Well that's a wrap for this week. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Come back for more climate solutions, reasons for hope, and ways each of us can make a difference. Climate Optimist is made possible by Climate Stewards Collective. You can find us on the web at climateoptimist.co. And don't forget to follow us on social at Climate Optimist Podcast.